What's up guys, Doll Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Time Ghost History video. So we're continuing the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we are now on Day 9. So the blockade has been set up. Obviously tensions are rising rather quickly at this point. Uh, the public is now well aware of what's going on, uh, to a certain degree, obviously. Um, and yeah, so this is killer submarines sneaking through the blockade. So... In the last one, we saw that the Soviets are going to try to push the one ship through there before the blockade gets there, uh, because it should be able to make it in time. And then they also have submarines that they're trying to send under. Uh, so yeah, let's find out what goes on here. Link to the original video down below, and let's jump into it. Day 9. You know the game Battleship, where you sit on opposite sides of a screen, and you try to sink the other guy's ships by guessing what grid coordinates they're at? Imagine how frustrating that game can be when your opponent takes all of his ships off the grid without telling you. That is pretty much how the U.S. military feels on October 24th, 1962, as their naval blockade on Cuba goes into effect. This is Time Ghost, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. Yesterday, the Soviet top brass met for the first time to discuss the crisis. They decided to not provoke the U.S. openly by sailing through the blockade line, but to still keep their nuclear missiles on Cuba and run the line with four Foxtrot-class nuclear-armed submarines. American President John F. Kennedy spent the whole day dealing with the details of how to get the blockade in place politically and how to enforce it militarily. He was worried about political fallout for having acted so late in the day. And Attorney General Robert Kennedy was pessimistic about the effects of the blockade. Uh, the uh, question that I've heard raised uh, rather extensively is that uh, why uh, this was not uncovered uh, sooner uh, when there were uh, some uh, reports about it, uh, why uh, we didn't know about it. Therefore, uh, why a uh, blockade of uh, some kind was not instituted earlier. Some things, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Paul, the Senator Keaton, just politicians talking about shit they have no idea what they're talking about. Honestly, it's probably worse now. The amount of time, like, especially when it comes to technology and stuff, the amount of times I've seen, like, a, uh, a senatorial hearing or congressional hearing or something like that, and you see the politicians talking about, like, just some, like, average civilian technology, right? Like computers or something, or Google or Facebook or Amazon, and, like, they have no idea what they're talking about. It honestly blows my mind. Like, the the amount of confidence they'll talk about stuff that they have no idea with is it's kind of impressive. Um, and, it, you know, if they didn't... If they didn't have so much control over people, it would be a lot less worrisome, too. That is very true. Now, it seems to me somebody in a uh, responsible position ought to take up this question. I don't think that it's realized how quickly these mobile bases can be set up and At 2 p.m. Greenwich time, so 10 a.m. in Washington, D.C., October 24th, 1962, the blockade of Cuba goes into effect. The president and XCOM, the National Security Committee dealing with the crisis, are now huddled up in the White House monitoring developments. The atmosphere is tense as they wait to see what the Soviets will do. One concern is what to do about submarines if they are caught breaking the blockade. How do you get them to surface? Yeah, oh yeah, so they're, they are talking about depth charges. I was going to say, you could use depth charges, but the problem is that, you know, you're attacking a Soviet submarine that's a declaration of war. Although I guess, you know, the blockade is kind of a declaration of war itself, right? They were talking about that in an earlier video where... Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works. I think it's by UN standards. I'm not sure exactly like, what law, some international law, but I'm not sure exactly who uh, decides this. But they were saying that the blockade is essentially like a soft declaration of war. Situation. We have death charges that have 
have such a small charge that they can be dropped and they can actually hit the submarine without damaging the submarine in practice depth, in practice depth charges. And we propose to use those as warning depth charges. The message that Alex was talking about states that when our forces come upon an unidentified submarine, we will ask it to come to the surface for inspection by transmitting the following signals using a depth charge of this type and also using certain sonar <coughs> signals which they may not be able to, to uh, accept and, and uh, interpret. And therefore, it's the depth charge that is the, the warning notice and the instruction to serve. Man, you know, I, I doubt they had it at the time, but you know how, like, the uh, Colombian and, like, Ecuadorian and those guys, like, all the the Coke dealers now have, like, those little subs that they take through the, the Caribbean to get Coke up here? It would be so, like, I doubt they had them at the time because it was a lot more uh, advanced technology, you know, comparatively at the time. But it would have been funny if just, like, one of those little Coke submarines gets in the middle of all this. This is a very dangerous operation and can easily end up sinking the submarine or provoking a response, a nuclear response. Later in the day, Robert Kennedy will write down that these few minutes were the time of greatest worry by the president. His hand went up to his face and covered his mouth and he closed his fist. His eyes were tense, almost gray, and we just stared at each other across the table. They debate the danger of the proposed anti-submarine actions until CIA Director McCone interrupts that conversation. Uh, Mr. President, I have a note just handed me from Sheriff that uh, we just received information from the Air Force that almost six uh, Soviet ships currently... What's ONI? Uh, see, I only know ONI is like Oni from uh, Halo. Identified in. Oh, I get Office of Naval Intelligence. I'm guessing it's the exact same thing as it is in Halo. That would make sense, considering... Halo is like literally just like the U.S. It's it's like the United Nations Space Command, but it's basically just the U.S. It's the ships heading towards the blockade that are being referred to. The sudden message is a bit strange, though, as we'll see in a moment. Now. A lot has been made over the years of this being the moment when the U.S. and the USSR stood eyeball to eyeball and the other fellow just flinched as the Russian ships approach the line and seemingly turn around at the last moment. The eyeball quote is attributed to Secretary of State Dean Rusk, who whispers it to National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. Apparently he does do this, but there was never an eyeball moment here. The Russian ships with the military equipment on board were already ordered to turn back or to stop 24 hours ago. Rusk does not know this, though, and it's interesting to see why he does not know this. During the past 24 hours, you'd think that the U.S. Air Force and Navy would have noticed, given that they have now positioned 12 destroyers along a 500-mile arc stretching east of to northwest of Cuba. There's an aircraft carrier group south of Cuba. Several submarines patrol the waters. Dozens of planes and a bunch of smaller ships monitor the Soviet cargo vessels. The fact is, they did notice already on the 23rd. But for some reason, the Air Force and the Navy choose not to report this to XCOM. Now, we cannot be sure of why the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not report it. We the Warhawks still trying to drag them into that war. Is that what's going on here? We do know that they are opposed to the blockade and for a harder confrontation especially U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff General Curtis LeMay, one of the recipients of the report that the blockade is seemingly being respected, then again, maybe the chief's observations were just inconclusive. A few words about Curtis LeMay here. He directed the firebombing yeah, campaign on Japan in 1945 that killed some 500,000 civilians and left millions more homeless. So he is no stranger to offensive war. He also was furious that he was not allowed to nuke North Korea. In fact, <laughs> they literally had to lock up the nukes to prevent him from using them. <laughs> so this guy's like a hardcore war hawk. He's like, bomb first, ask questions later. So he carpet bombed urban areas and dams, destroying agriculture and causing famine. He and JFK loathe each other. So anyhow, does this mean 
that the crisis is now over, only the president and his men just haven't noticed yet. Far from it. This is the beginning. First of all, do not forget those four nuclear-armed Soviet submarines that are not turning around. Second of all, there is the issue of the Soviets removing their missiles from Cuba. Khrushchev has penned a strongly worded letter Kennedy is about to receive. The letter does not concede anything, though, and does not even acknowledge the existence of the missiles. He writes, You are doing all this not only out of hatred for the Cuban people and its government, but also because of considerations of the election campaign in the United States. I mean, he's not wrong there. Like, well, I mean, the people think he is wrong. They're definitely doing it out of the hatred of the Cuban government um, and out of election concerns. They don't really hate the people. But, you know, they're not blaming them for the fucking uh, communist takeover. So he's not entirely wrong there. What morality, what law can justify such an approach by the American government to international affairs? No Monroe such doctrine. morality or law can be found because the actions of the United States with regard to Cuba constitute outright banditry or, if you like, the folly of degenerate imperialism. <laughs> so, I mean, in some ways he's not wrong. The problem is, like, the hypocrisy with this quote, right? They overthrew the previous Cuban government, right? They, they were behind the coup. They, you know, gave... Um, you know, Castro and Guevara, the means to do it, the training to do it, all of this stuff. It, it was, this is one of the things I've always found, like, hilariously ironic about Marxists, is they have, you know, often a accurate um, complaint against the West of imperialism. But, you know, it, it's highly hypocritical when they do it themselves, Right. Like, you know, the, like the idea that them overthrowing a government is different because they're communist. Right. Uh, this is you, you kind of see this even with like modern Marxists, but it's like very much a ends justify the means type situation. And uh, it's, a, you know, it, there, there's no there's there's no bad strategy, only bad end goals. Uh, there's, there's actually a phrase for this. I can't remember what it's called. I've heard it multiple times before, but. Uh, essentially the idea that, you know, they're, they they have no problem with a double standard because, you know, it, it's very tribal. It's like as, as far as they're concerned, if it's, you know, for their goal or for a goal aligned with theirs, it's good. If it's, you know, for a goal that's not aligned with theirs, it's bad no matter what it is. Even if it's something that morally they agree with, it's bad because it's pro-capitalist. Right? But anyway. He gives the U.S. leadership good reason to believe that the blockade will not be respected. The Soviet government considers that the violation of the freedom to use international waters and international airspace is an act of aggression which pushes mankind towards the abyss of a world nuclear missile war. Therefore, the Soviet government cannot instruct the captains of Soviet vessels bound for Cuba to observe the orders of American naval forces blockading that island. Our instructions to Soviet mariners are to observe strictly the universally accepted norms of navigation in international waters and not to retreat one step from them. It's a partial bluff, but he also goes from veiled threats to direct promises of retaliation. Naturally, we will not simply be bystanders with regard to piratical acts by American ships on the high seas. We will then be forced on our part to take the measures we consider necessary and adequate in order to protect our rights. We have everything necessary to do so. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy has stepped up another action that will further escalate the situation. So far... CIA-operated U-2 high-altitude planes have been furnishing photographic evidence of the missile buildup. But it's been a sore spot with XCOM since the start of the crisis that these photos are so difficult to analyze, do not furnish proof that is understandable to a layman, and are not precise enough to identify how close the missiles are to being ready. Until the crisis was made public, they refrained from low-altitude recon flights, as this would, first of all, be really dangerous, and second of all, force things to become public right away. But yesterday, Captain William Ecker and his wingman, Lieutenant Bruce Wilhelmy, made the first low- Man, that guy looks so young. I don't know if he's actually that young, but he looks like he's like 17. Altitude flights. Now, 
This is real Top Gun style flight stunts we're talking here. Except they have no guns, only cameras on board. They're flying in RF-8 Crusaders. That is the unarmed recon version of the F-8 Crusader. And to make really clear photos, they have to fly really low. Like, I mean, really, really low. And to not get shot down, they have to fly fast. Really, really fast. They take off from Jacksonville, Florida, and head for Cuba at their regular flight altitude. As they approach the island, though, they take the planes down to just 400 feet over the ocean, God flying damn. at 400 miles per hour. As they fly in over Cuba, they are certain to be detected. I mean, you know, a fighter jet roaring by only 25 stories above your head is hard to miss, right? Ecker and Wilhelmy are heading for the missiles at San Cristobal. As they scream over the site, Cuban and Russian soldiers scramble for their guns. One picture even reveals a Cuban soldier tripping out of an outhouse with his trousers still around his knees. <laughs> Man, imagine being immortalized by that picture. You're the guy fucking running out of the outhouse, stumbling, fucking, oh man. Snap their cameras, capturing crystal clear images of the site. When they're already out of range, they see the smoke puffs of the anti-aircraft artillery behind them. In total, it takes them under four minutes to fly over Cuba, but they're not out of danger. Ecker will remember. Then it got kind of hectic. We were flying right into the granddaddy of all thunderstorms. We're talking a wall of clouds rising to 50,000, 60,000 feet. Here I've got the pictures, and if the airplane gets busted all to pieces, it wouldn't do anybody any good. At the last second, I see a jet-sized hole open up in the clouds. It was just a sunspot. I said, burners now. We popped out the top. When he returns to- Man, it's like some fucking movie shit. The base, he's not even allowed to leave his plane. He's ordered to fly straight to Washington. There, to his astonishment, He's debriefed at the Pentagon directly by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Taylor, and several of the other chiefs. Ecker has taken off his pressure suit, and underneath his uniform is wet with sweat. He apologizes. One of the generals takes his cigar out of his mouth and says, you're a pilot. You're supposed to be goddamn sweaty. <laughs> May is fuming at the Navy for having upstaged his Air Force, and later, when the pilots are decorated for the action during a... Wait, I, I thought it was the CIA. I, I'm guessing they were working in conjunction with the Navy. White House event. LeMay will refuse to take part in the ceremony, remaining in his limousine, pouting and chomping on his cigar. Oh, what a baby. In any case, President Kennedy and Ambassador to the UN Adlai Stevenson now have the photographic evidence they need to confront the Soviets. But they also now know that several of the nuclear missiles are ready and can be fired at short notice. Robert Kennedy was right. What we are doing now is, in fact, closing the barn door after the horse is gone. The blockade has not resolved anything, and instead, the world has taken yet another few steps towards nuclear war. The U.S. Strategic Command is now taken to defense readiness level DEFCON 2, the final stage before imminent nuclear war. See you on the ninth day of the crisis when the showdown continues. If you missed our- See you on the ninth day when the showdown- This is day nine. I mean, I, technically this is like day 11, because they had two- Well, I think day 13, because they had two prelude episodes. Then they had a day zero. So this is like already like day 12. You can see the next one on day nine. Our episode where the U-2 spy planes are explained in detail, you can find it right here. And do not forget to subscribe, and please support us at patreon.com or timegoes.tv so that we can make more awesome history. Good night, and good luck. <laughs> Oh, did they get rid of the intro? I didn't even notice that. I'm guessing they got rid of the intro because it was uh, copyrighted. Because I know I got... Uh, every, every one of the videos I've done so far ended up getting a copyright claim. But, uh, you know, it's, not, it's no big deal. I, I, I'm enjoying these. I actually don't mind it when it's a, a good video. It's kind of irritating when it's something like you don't really care to watch. And then, you know, you get copyrighted on it anyway. But when, it, when it's good stuff like this, I don't really care. But uh, anyway, yeah. So we got day 10 next, which is the showdown in the United Nations. So we're finally going to say see Adlai Stevenson go head to head uh with the Russian counterpart. I can't remember his name, but anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.